And when you think about Talent Connect, when you think about all of your roles, your, your roles as uh, real influencer, influencers and difference makers in your organization, Talent Connect, our roles, it's about inspiration. And I can't think of a more inspiring story than what you're about to hear from a very special guest. Doc Henley has a really unique story. How many of you have been touched by someone or something in your life and it's caused a huge pivot in your life direction? Let me cue up a video right now to show you a little bit about what we're talking about. Cue the video, please. 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. My efforts are gonna be a drop in the bucket. But if I had never taken that step because it was too big of a problem, then we wouldn't be anywhere right now. In December of 2003 is when the idea came for the organization Wine to Water. We are very involved with water filtration around the world. When we take the water from the street and we put it in here, the water that's in the bottom is not going to be making you feel sick to your stomach anymore. February of last year, I get a phone call from someone in the Scene and Heroes department saying that I've been nominated, which was completely shocking. From Boone, North Carolina, meet Doc Henley. Through his Wine to Water program, this bartender provides clean, sustainable water to thousands worldwide. This ceiling that we were kept hitting over and over, that we can only tell this amount of people about this water crisis, was just completely shattered. Everything from when you're nominated uh, to getting through the top ten to being in the Kodak Theater could not have made me and everybody that was around me feel more special. But I'm very proud to be a part of this group. For many, trapped in the rubble of downtown Port-au-Prince, the struggle to live continues. The earthquake happened in Haiti. Immediately, I went down there and to figure out where I could be plugged in. She can't get well if she doesn't have anything to drink. Obviously, you can see it's something that is that I'm very passionate about now. Um, no, sorry, I never, yeah. yeah. In five years, my goal is to have reached a million people for clean water. If you find something you're passionate about, I don't care who you are, you will make a difference. My name is Doc Kinley. I'm a 2009 CNN hero. I started the organization Wine to Water. Give a warm Talent Connect welcome to Doc Henley. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I gotta be I gotta be real honest with y'all. Um, I always have a hard time starting out with that video because CNN's job when they made it was to make me look as perfect as possible. They, they, had a, they had a lady with a makeup kit that would follow me around and powder my nose every few seconds, and then somebody that would like fix my beard to make sure there wasn't any stragglers or anything like that. And uh, the problem with that is that's, that's not who I am at all. I'm one of the more imperfect, average, maybe even below average people that you'll ever meet in your entire life. And uh, it was hard for me growing up with that type of uh, mentality. I, I actually had a really difficult time uh, as a kid because everybody in my family, it seemed to me, were, were exceptional in some way, shape, or form. And just to give you an idea, I think I come from a little bit of an extreme case. Um, so I love sports growing up. I, my family's real athletic, but I never measured up to anyone, my brothers, my, my cousins, my granddaddy. And to give you an idea, my, my granddaddy played professional football for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So uh, I tried to play football, but I was never, you know, even close to that good at all. Um, and basketball, I love playing basketball, but uh, I wasn't anything like my younger brother by four and a half years. He's six foot nine, okay? So can you imagine when you're, I'm 19 years old and trying to play ball and I get dunked on by my 15-year-old brother? It's not really good for your ego. And uh, I played golf as well. I enjoyed that, but I was never like my cousin who I grew up with. Um, his name's Lucas Glover. He's on the PGA Tour right now. He won the U.S. Open a few years ago. Yeah, so it was hard for me. It was difficult uh, to try to be an athlete uh, because I was never great, never liked them. In fact, I, I rarely got off the bench. 
And then if you even take uh, academics, uh, I, I, you know, how was a C, C minus, maybe a few Ds here and there type student. Um, I, I learned later on in life that I, I, I don't do so well uh, in the classroom setting. I have to get my hands dirty. I got to see it. I got to figure out, you know, what, what makes it tick to, to learn. So it was tough for me in school, but it was harder to see my sister who, she was top of the class. She was like the salutatorian or the valedictorian or one of the, one of the really smart people that when they walk down the stage at graduation, her robe looks completely different than everybody else. She's so got all these things hanging down her neck and a different colored tassel. And I just was lucky to, to get to walk down the stage. And uh, so for me, it was difficult. Everything I tried to do, I always felt like I just never, I never measured up. You know, and, and uh, so what happened? Uh, what, what changed? Why am I up here today? Uh, I, don't really, I don't really know. I don't really have a great answer to that, but I know exactly when it happened. Uh, this was December of 2003. Uh, I, I was uh, trying to struggle my way through a university degree at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Uh, I, I decided to be a communications major. I have one semester left in communications, and uh, to be honest, I, I, even though I had one semester left, I still had no idea what a communications major did when they got out of school. <laughs> no clue. Uh, in, in fact, I think I might have taken the major for all the wrong reasons, because when I sat down with my academic advisor after a couple of years, she's like, Doc, you can't just take classes in randomness and expect to major in everything or, or randomness. You, you have to pick something. And I'm like, okay, well, well, show me what you got. So she laid them out, and she mistakenly showed me the gender breakdown uh, of each major. <laughs> and there was 80% women in communications. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but that's exactly what I want to be studying right there. <laughs> and uh, so I'm taking this major, of course, for all the right or wrong reasons, however you want to look at it. Um, and I'm also bartending my way through school and, and playing some music out at, at different nightclubs and, and bars around Raleigh. And I actually really really loved that, that job. I loved that scene. Um, and it was not because of the late nights and the party and all that stuff. I actually really loved it. You know, you know five o'clock happy hour would come. I'd have all my regulars. And you'd have a, a guy with a white collar who's a CEO of some company sitting next to a construction worker, next to a school teacher, next to a stay-at-home mom, next to somebody that's just lost their job. And everybody's on the, on the same playing field. Nobody's looking up or down at anybody else. Everybody's there just to kind of forget about their day, uh, to talk about sports or politics or whatever, and just there's, there's none of this up and down stuff. So to me, it was really about the people, why I loved being a bartender. It was the relationships that, that brought me back every day with a smile on my face and I, when I actually couldn't wait to get to my job. But I also got to the point at that same time where I had a great friend of mine, uh, her name is Tasha Sullivan. And, uh, she sat me down one night. I'd just gotten done playing a gig um, uh, at this club. And, and y'all, I'm, I'm not even a great musician. I'm not a, any American Idol. I'll never win anything like that. I sing stuff like, uh, like Johnny Cash. You know, I could be like, I hear the train coming. It's rolling around the bend. You know, you don't have to have an amazing voice to do that. In fact, I could wake up with a cold that morning and sound better, <laughs> sound more like Johnny Cash. So I, I, I'm getting done with a gig. I'm sitting at the bar, and she's, she looked over at me, and she's like, is this it? Is this all you're going to do, do with your life? You're going to bartend, you know, maybe finish your degree, and that's it. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I hadn't really thought much about it. I, I don't, yeah, sure. She's like, you're, you're better than that. If you sell yourself short, and this is all you do for the rest of your life, I might be your best friend, but I'm, I, hey, I'm going to be pretty, pretty pissed at you. And it was the first time, actually, that somebody had had been very honest with me, somebody that I trusted, but that did it in an encouraging way and said, you can do better. Because most of my life, I, I'd seen my coaches, my parents, my, my teachers, they'd put their arms around my brothers and sisters and cousins and say, you know, you're going to do great things with your life. And then they'd put their arm around me and be like, you know, Doc, we just hope you stay out of prison, buddy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. So it, it, was, it was strange to have somebody encourage me like that and think that I could do better. And so I took a break from school, from bartending. I uh, went home. My parents were living in a small mountain town in, in, the, in, in the mountains of North Carolina. And, uh, and it was really strange. I, one night, really late, I was kind of in between sleep and not quite asleep, not quite awake. And I had this phrase over and over in my head. And um, it was the phrase, wine to water. 
wine to water. And I, I couldn't get it out, so I, I woke up, grabbed a pad and a pen, and uh, I was thinking, you know, I write a little bit of music too. Maybe this is the inspiration for some, you know, kind of country song. And so I started writing it down. And right when I stared at it on the page, I, my insides got, I got all knotted up. You know, and I, I was looking at the words and you know, obviously I'd heard it the other way around. My, my old man was a preacher man growing up, and he told me about the first miracle, water to wine. And actually that was my favorite one because it, it proved that that Jesus guy was probably way cooler than what I had thought about growing up. <laughs> like, there was a party, it ran out of booze, and he made a bunch of wine so it would continue. <laughs> and I'm like, man. So I, I've heard it the other way around, but why is it backwards? And uh, I just kept staring at that last word, water. And I felt like I was supposed to know something. And, um, and I probably shouldn't say this to this crowd here, but uh, up until then especially, I, I was probably the most technologically unsavvy person that you'll ever meet in your entire life. Um, and so I just heard from some friends at school that there was this thing called Google out there that you could go in and type in like questions and information and it would just spit back answers to you, you know? So I go down and get on my parents' computer and I type in, you know, water, issues, actually it's probably more like water issues, water problems, and, uh, and what filled up that screen was what, was what changed my life. The very first thing I saw was 1.1 billion people with a B don't have access to clean drinking water. I remember staring at that and thinking, you know, that, that, can't, that can't be right. I'm not a math major, but I'm pretty sure there's only six or seven billion people in the world. So if over one of those billion doesn't have access to clean water, I'm pretty sure that I would have heard about this by now. So I'm pretty sure this Google thing is all jacked up. There's no way that it could be right. But sure enough, one search after another, after another, one UN article after another, over a billion people. And then the next article just did it in for me. It was from the WHO, and it said that uh, more children in our world die from dirty water than anything else. And then it listed three more. The, t uh, the second one was one that I'd heard plenty about, HIV AIDS. Uh, some of my favorite mu musicians, they do the red campaigns, and they wear the, the ribbons, and I heard plenty about that. The third one was malaria. You know, I, I learned in school that malaria killed more of our soldiers in Vietnam than bullets. You know, I knew that was pretty bad. And the last one, I didn't know much about it. Uh, it was tuberculosis. The third was tuberculosis. And uh, I didn't know much, but I, there was this game I used to play when I was younger in school that was called Oregon Trail. And you'd try to, you know, get all the way to Oregon with your family. And my wife would always die from tuberculosis. So I don't, I don't know what it was, but it, I knew it was pretty bad. So the next thing I saw is just shocked me. It said, Dirty water kills more than all three of those combined together. Yet it receives less than 20% of the funding in the research, while those other three receive over 80%. I just remember staring at that and thinking, that's, that's just not right. And I think that was the very first night that, you know, I always had this voice in my head, I felt like that, just said, you know, you're not, you're nobody. You're not good enough. Who, who do you think you are? I think you can do something about this. I think it was the first time I just decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut that voice off, and I'm going to try. And so I tried to do one thing. I didn't have the concept to have this great international organization that's in 15 different countries around the world. I just wanted to do one event, raise money for maybe help one family or, or one village. And so I took that pad, and instead of writing some cheesy country song that would have never done anything anyway, I... Uh, I just jotted out the concept for, for an event. And I, I looked at, you know, the resources I had as a bartender, and I thought, you know, I've got plenty of access to booze, which is really important if you're going to have a successful event. So I can get booze, and, uh, you know, I, can, I, can, I got live music from yours truly right here, so I can, I've got some entertainment. I can get a free place from, you know, a local club owner. Within about a month and a half time, this was February 2004, I had put on the very first wine to water event. And by the end of the night, over 300 people had showed up. We raised about five or $6,000. And I remember counting that money. I'd never seen that much money in one place at one time. And it was the very first time I felt like, you know, I, it worked. Something I, I did actually worked. 
And then that same night, there was a restaurant owner that came and said, hey, you know, that was awesome. Can we do that at my place? And I'm like, sure. So did another event a month later, another few thousand comes in. I opened a P.O. box, a bank account, and people started sending in checks. And we, before we knew it, we got to like tens of thousands of dollars in a bank account. And, uh, and, I, and then I started freaking out because I didn't have any charity status or nothing. I, I may have been doing something illegal. I don't even know. <laughs> you know, I started taking money, and I'm like, yeah, sweet. So uh, I, 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 I'm good. I, I didn't break any laws or anything. But I, I started looking at, well, how am I going to get these, this money to these people here? I've never been overseas. And it'd be great to be the guy that gets to go over and drill the well and build the water filter or whatever these people do, but I don't know how to do that work. So I started thinking, you know, the best thing I could do is just take all this money and just give it away uh, to somebody that's already doing great work. So I found a local organization that actually had some great water projects, and I got a meeting with their top guy, uh, got set in his office. He came in and sat down and was very direct and said, you know, what, what can I help you with? His name is Kenny Isaacs, and I said, when I get nervous, I talk really fast. So I said, M Mr. Isaacs, my, my, my name is Doc Henley. I, I'm a bartender in Raleigh, and I've, I've raised like tens of thousands of dollars, and I just want to give it to you. And uh, he's like, S slow down, Doc. You're a bartender in Raleigh, and you, you've raised a lot of money. And you just come in here, you're ready to give it to me. And uh, you're not skimming off the top, taking any for yourself? No, sir. And you're just going to keep doing this, all volunteer? Yes, sir. He said, well, why? Why would you do that? And I thought for a minute, and I, I said, you know, I'm not, really, I'm not really sure why. I just know that something's changed in me since I've started doing this. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I have the ability to accomplish something, and, and, but not for myself, to, to change the world around me and to help somebody else out. So if it's okay, I'm just going to keep doing this and keep, keep giving you the money. And um, he said, I tell you what, I got a better idea. How about you come work for me? You're getting ready to finish school. I'll send you anywhere in the world you want to go. I'll teach and train you how to do this work. And then you can come back after your time's up and, and continue to grow this organization because it seems like you know how to raise the money. And then we'll just give you that field knowledge and you can put the two together. And uh, so I almost fell out of my chair, of course. And I said, y yes, that, that would be sweet. And uh, his next question was, well, wh where do you want to go? And I said, well, Mr. Isaacs, I don't, I don't know much about the world. I'm not a geography or geology major or whatever majors in the world. Um, but I think if you just send me to the worst place, and then we'll call it even. And people think I was being, um, you know, maybe brave or courageous by asking that. And that's, that's not the case at all. Actually, what I was thinking is if I didn't view myself as the most intelligent person in the world, I figured that if I went to the worst place in the world, I'd still have a pretty good impact. You know, that was, that was my thought process. So it kind of went between Afghanistan. He's like, you know, it's pretty bad. Obviously, there's a war going on there, it's, you know, only a couple years after uh, September 11th. Um, but we've got a team on the ground. They can, they can help, you know, you get acclimated and figure out what you need to do. There's this other place uh, in Sudan, in the western region, called Darfur. Uh, it's in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa. There's a m massive water crisis. But there's also a genocide and a civil war going on there. And, uh, oh, yeah, there's nobody there. So when you get there, you'll be one of the first people on the ground for us, and you'll have to just kind of figure it out on your own. And I'm like, desert, genocide, war, alone. <laughs> yep, I think that's about the worst place. So um, uh, six months after my very, um, my very first event, um, I'm on a p plane to this place that you see behind me here. This has been about August of... Uh, of 2004, and um, the place changed my life. I learned more lessons in the year that I spent in the desert there in Darfur than I've learned in the previous, what, 24, 25 years of my life before that. Uh, one of the first ones was here in this camp. It's called Marla Camp, 10,000 people living in this, in this uh, refugee camp here. And I had my little point-and-shoot camera with me, and I snapped this shot. This was the beginning of their four to five hour walk every day outside of their camp to find water. Mostly women and children. And when these women and children would walk back and bring that water, it actually would make the youngest kids quite sick because the, the water they find was filthy. And I remember staring at that and saying, I've, I've got to do something about this. And so we, we set up, a, it took us a while, we set up a, a water, 
a water point right in the middle of their camp, clean water, they don't, not looking like, you know, chocolate milk like the other water that they were drinking, clean water that was not making them sick, and it was only three or four minutes for them to get that bucket, not four or five hours. And on top of that, the whole reason why they were living in camps is in that genocide, it was uh, pretty insecure. So the whole concept of safety in numbers, and they had a, a local rebel group I'll talk about in just a minute that was, that was keeping them safe. But when they walked out of that camp, that's, that's when bad things happened to women and, and children in a, in a war setting. So you should see the change that, that day, that very first day that they walked to that, to that tank and they filled up their jugs with clean water. And it took them four or five minutes instead of hours. All these kids, thousands of them, they like surrounded me and my men, and they all just started like cheering and chanting, Moya, Moya, which is the local word there for water. And, uh, and then next thing you know, they all broke off and just started playing and going crazy. And I realized that this is probably the first time since this war started that these kids actually got to be children. It was a huge day for me and, and made me realize this water crisis, it does so much more than steal their physical lives. But kids all around the world are walking hours upon hours every day. It steals their childhood. They don't get a chance to be kids. They're working, they're walking to get their most basic need every day. So it fueled me on, but I had to learn another tough lesson from, from Marla. Um, uh, a month after we began to work there, a uh, government helicopter came in and, and, uh, and bombed the whole camp. And uh, so it was difficult because I became friends with a lot of these people, and, and to see that was, uh, was pretty hard for me. But we continued to push on, and in order to do that, I had to work alongside uh, these guys here. Um, uh, these were the rebels that were fighting against the government, saying, we're not going to allow you to rape and kill our women and children anymore. And uh, you could see them as the good guys because they were protecting their people. The problem is, is that they actually uh, killed just as many humanitarian workers such as myself uh, as did the bad guys, because uh, they didn't trust anyone. They thought everybody was a spy. Um, but then I started looking at how these organizations work. Some of them would go into an area and they'd just kick food off the back of a truck as quick as they could, uh, give them food for a month, and phew, they were out of there. Or they'd go in there and they'd drill a well and give them water and phew, out of there. And I started looking at that and thinking, well, of course these people don't trust us. We've never taken the time to build a relationship with them. I learned that as a bartender. It didn't matter how fast I could make a drink and sling it across the bar. If I didn't take the time to get to know somebody, then uh, no, they're not going to want to come back and, and hang out with me. So I just decided to try to take that principle that I had learned there and, and use it. And so we do things a little differently. I, I would go um, to the guy two to the left of me there. He's got a big thing around his neck. That's a satellite phone. And it means he's, he's the big dog. And uh, the commander, I'd go up to him and I'd, I'd say, you know, Salam Alaikum, Alhamdulillah, Anadok. You know, I'd go through the, the Arabic that I had learned, the greetings, and I'd bring my translator along and, and uh, say, you know, can we, can I go back to your house? Can we, can we hang out and have coffee together? Can I share a meal with you? Can we go, can I have dinner with you? And you'd see these guys, they're always hardcore, and he'd be like, He'd smile and say, nam, nam, shukran, jizera, you know, thank you, thank you very much, come. And before we knew it, we're off in the truck and we're getting ready to slaughter a goat and have a good time and I'm meeting his wife and his kids and, and it was great. And I realized that's all it took. I didn't go in there and start talking about work saying, hey, I'm here from the West to save you and give you a well and leave. But no, I'm here to get to know you as a man, as a father, as a husband. And if I can help, I, I would love to. That's all it took to build a relationship with these guys and get a free pass, really, for me, that I got to work in any area that I, that I wanted to work in because of that. Another difficult lesson I had to learn was from this guy here. Um, his name is Mustafa. Uh, he, he was 12 years old when I took this picture. He began fighting with the rebels when he was nine. His entire family was killed. Um, but one of his commanders, I was sitting down with him one day, and, and uh, he explained to me that Mustafa was constantly sick. Uh, and that, that more than likely if they had another serious uh, water issue in their village, that he probably would be one of the first soldiers to, to not make it. And he began to explain to me that they fight a lot of times, two, three times a week, they'll go off and fight, and they might lose a man or two, but that they're actually, they're getting, they don't lose nearly as many people to the fighting as they do to their water. 
And when I saw this hardcore soldier, and you see guys like Mustafa, actually the child soldiers are the most hardcore. You hardly ever see them smile. And when you hear from this commander that their biggest fear wasn't the bullets that were whizzing by their ears every day, but it was their water. You know, it didn't make sense to me. I don't understand politics. I don't understand international policy. I don't know how to make this war stop. But water is easy. It took no time for me to learn how to go and start fixing broken wells and helping them treat their water supplies, even using local resources. It's an easy fix. But that was their number one threat to their lives. And so it really pushed me on, and we began to go around uh, all the desert regions of Darfur and fix wells like this. I didn't have the money for really expensive drilling machines, and I couldn't drill brand new $10,000 wells because we didn't have the, the funding for that. Um, but me and my local guys, we, we would buy toolkits from the local market and use local parts, and we'd go around to the broken wells. I found out doing some research that over 60% of the wells throughout all of sub-Saharan Africa are broken. They're in non-working order. So we went around and we started fixing these wells. And, uh, and then I got to a point where I'm like, well, that's not really a, a good idea because we're just going to leave. I'm not going to live here forever. I need to teach these people how to take care of their own well. So we bring extra toolkits and extra supplies and we bring along the community leaders and teach them how to fix and maintain their own well. And from that point, I decided, you know what? When I saw the change in these people's lives and how much it empowered them Instead of just going and throwing something at him and saying, here you go, have a nice life. But here you go, here's some teaching, some training, some education, some resources on how to take care of your own issues. You should see the change in the community that would happen when we would do that. And I decided that's how I want to grow this organization when I get home. So I was all raring and ready to go and re excited to come back. Um, and I had a couple difficult lessons I had to learn before that. Um, uh, everything seemed to be going well. And on the way back, actually, from Mustafa's area, uh, I was driving through a village that normally had no people in it. I noticed there was these guys with machine guns, and, and uh, I've had them jump out in the road before, the bad guys, the Janjaweed who work for the government. They'd jump out, and they'd shoot their guns, and they'd stop us. Sometimes they pulled my men out of the car, and they'd beat them, stripped them naked, stole all our stuff. We've had some bad stuff happen. But they were never like they were this time. They were all kind of hidden. Uh, and I couldn't barely see quite a few of them that were kind of behind trees and rocks. And I'm thinking, do I need to stop and, and reason with them or do I just go? And I, before I could really think, I just stepped on the gas. And right when I did, there was a guy right here that shot his gun. And the rest of them began to shoot. And they shot out my windows. And uh, I had two gas tanks on that truck. They shot out that gas tank. And they shot us up pretty good. And um, uh, we made it uh, through miraculously. I was able to pull through and... and uh, I stopped and looked at my truck. I traced a lot of the bullets and as they were coming in. There was one in particular that really caught my eye. It was coming straight for me right here. It went through the back of my window and was coming straight for me. And I had a chlorine tablet box in the back of the truck that you could see the bullet as it was heading right from my back. The, 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 the cardboard was curling up where it was coming right at me. And then at the last second, you could just see where it just took like a 90 degree turn and just slammed into the side of the wall. And I stared at that one for a long time, and, and I kind of got to a point where I'm like, you know, I might lose my life doing this work. But, you know, I, I, think, I think it's worth it. Maybe that means I'm, I'm supposed to be doing this, you know. So I kept working, and just before I was about to leave, I lost one of my men. Uh, they, the, the government found out he was working with me, and he was coming in on a bus to, to work on Saturday morning. And they pulled him off the bus, and they put him face down, and... And they shot him in the head. And I had to, for my first time, I, I learned how to dig wells when I was there and do a lot of work. But I was invited by his father and his brothers to help dig his grave. You know, they taught me how to do it the way uh, for Islamic culture, you know, face him to the east and slide him in. And, and the whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking that, that this was my fault. You know, I made the choice for myself to do this work knowing I was putting my life at risk. But I also made the choice for, for Ismail as well, and he didn't make it. And uh, it was difficult for me to come home, uh, but I did. I came back, and, and, uh, and I have to be honest, I was getting ready to, to throw it all up in the air and quit. And say, I, I, I'm, I didn't sign up for this. This is not what I, 
what I signed up for. And I was getting ready to go right back to bartending. I probably would have had I, had I not met my wife. Uh, I met her uh, just the week after coming home in a, in a bar, of course. I, I was, you know, craving cold beer and some live music. And I went in the corner and I had my cowboy hat on, tucked low. I didn't want to talk to nobody. And before I knew it, like this whole group of like smoking hot girls walks in the bar. And I've been in the desert for a year, a whole year. <laughs> and I look and I'm like, whoa. But then I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I have no game. If I ever had it, it was gone, you know. So I kind of went back to my own thing. And, and, and next thing I know, the smokingest, hottest one and the whole group had come up and tapped me on the shoulder. And she's like, hi, hi my name's Amber. What, what's your name? And I'm like, hi, 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 my, name, my name's Doc. Nice to meet you. She's like, oh, Doc, Doc, is that, is that your real name? Are you a doctor? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not a doctor. Just, you, just, you just call me Doc. And she's like, oh, well, well what's, your, what's your real name? I'm like, you, you, you just call me Doc. Everybody's called me Doc since I was little. She's like, what's your real name? <laughs> and I'm like, lady, I just met you. How can you be demanding my name? And I'm like, okay, look, my real name is Dixon. And um, my, my parents named me that. My sister was two years older than me. She couldn't pronounce Dixon, so she called me Dick Doc. So... <laughs> Uh, for, for a while there, uh, I was called Dick Doc, and <laughs> somewhere along the way, they dropped the dick, they left the doc, and that's how I got Doc, you know. So um, it was great. I, after that night, we, we hung out almost every day until we got married. And um, it took me about a year, really, to pull myself back together, but I couldn't have done it without her help at all. Hands down. I'd be in a gutter somewhere in Raleigh, probably. And I learned a lot of lessons from, from her. And as I look back, and my friend Tasha as well, before I left, that, you know, there's going to come times in life where, where we, you know, we just don't want to do it anymore. We might find something that we really love to do and that we're passionate about and that we really want to go hard for, but there's still those days where you, you just don't want to get out of bed in the morning and do it whether it's something extreme like losing somebody close to you or whether it's something even like as we begin to grow as an organization in 2007, I had to fill out the official nonprofit 501c3 paperwork that was stacked like that. And I'm like, I can't do this. I, I didn't sign up for this work. But if you have people around you, like my wife, like my best friend Tasha at the beginning that encouraged me, and as we began to grow as an organization, I began to surround myself with people that believed in me more than I believed in myself. To me, that's when the potential for success happens. That's when it's the most important. I don't have time to go through all the different countries that we've been in now. I'd love to talk about each one. And I actually think uh, later tonight, there's a little bit of a shindig going on later. And I think I get to stay for it. So I'd love to answer some questions about, you know, where we're working uh, a little later on. But I, there's something really important I want um, that I'd like to, to, to express, and that I think that y'all have such an opportunity. We were just talking about it before I had the chance to get up here and, and, and speak, and, and it's that, you know, y'all are the behind the scenes folks. You represent so many different companies, and you're what, you don't get the credit for it, but you're what makes it, you're what makes it work. And it's all about the people that you bring on and the relationship aspect that they bring to that community. And it's a huge thing. And I'm, absolutely honored to even have the opportunity to be here. And I know, I can't imagine how hard it must be sometimes because I made the mistake. Uh, I had a really important position I needed to fill last year. And I just took the person that had the best resume and I brought him in. And uh, our, our worst months were actually when I just brought on somebody because I needed to fill it really quickly. And, and we had to let that person go. And finally, I took my time uh, and found the person that meshed well relationally and with the team and then actually came in and supported and believed in me, you know, again, like I said, more than I even believe in myself. And since then, it's been three months, and we've had our best three months since we've started the organization. So y'all have a huge opportunity with what you're at, and I'm just super excited to have the chance to be here and speak with y'all today and, and share my story. And I want to leave you with one last picture. Uh, we began to go uh, after 2007, and, and we grew. The last place you saw was Ethiopia. Uh, Uganda here, uh, and then Haiti, you see behind me, um, was our ninth country. We're now in 15 countries. We just added Syria, working with the Syrian refugees. Um, but the last picture I want to leave you with 
is one that um, really, to me, sums up everything. Uh, I snuck up on this mom and her daughter in a, in a slum in, in Kampala. We had just helped them uh, get clean water, and I didn't want them to see me because I saw how much fun they were having just sitting on their porch in the morning drinking water. And they had nothing. They lived in one of the worst slums and trash dumps that I've ever seen. And this is what I saw. And this is what I think about of all the different countries I've traveled to. I don't remember, you know, sickly faces and kids with flies in their eyes and not feeling good and just upset with life in general. When I think about all the places I've been and the hard places I've been, these are the faces that I see and remember. And we come back here sometimes and it's difficult for me because we, we get stuck in a traffic jam too long or our, our phones aren't downloading or emails fast enough and we get pissed off about that. And then I remember quickly them who had nothing and that they're so content and happy with life. And y'all, I, I just, I hope that, that, that y'all could see that this, this life is so much more than just the day-to-day -day grind and the bottom line, but it's all about the people that make life worth living. So y'all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. God bless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.